الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما نافعا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن شاء الله tonight we will recite سورة الأعراف the complete سورة from half of the eighth juz till three quarters of the ninth juz that is where surah al-a'raf ends this is also one of the seven long surahs the sixth one surah al-a'raf and it's also a surah that was revealed in the meccan period and like all the majority of the meccan surahs they are common um, in their themes the most fundamental theme is to establish the oneness of Allah, to refute shirk, associating partners with Allah, to establish the prophethood of the Prophet وسلم, and a constant reminder of the hereafter. Right? This is one of the objectives that we should have in mind every time we read the Qur'an, we recite the Qur'an. This is um, why we need to recite Qur'an every day. Because there's a constant reminder of our afterlife. If we stop reciting Qur'an, we forget hereafter. This is a result of not reciting Qur'an, not understanding the Qur'an. Like those who have become distant of the Qur'an have very little or no awareness of the hereafter in their life. May Allah protect us. This is why the Qur'an is one of the greatest reminders of Akhirah. Right? Because, I mean... Akhirat is the objective of our uh, per, uh, our life in this world. dunya mazra'atul akhirah. The dunya, this world, is uh, a, a tilling place for the hereafter, meaning that we are working for our hereafter. Right? Let not anything else or anyone else, especially the devil, convince us otherwise. Right? Many people are convinced that they're actually working to live in this world. Uh, we spend our days and nights trying to um, facilitate our life in this world. And that's all that is on the mind of human beings. And this is a great deception of the shaitan. Anyways, nevertheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah with huruful muqatta'at, alif, lam, meem, saad. Allahu a'lamu bi muradihi bidhalika. Only Allah knows the true intended meaning of these letters. Then Allah mentions a very interesting verse addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, Kitabun unzila ilayka fala yakun fi sadrika harajum min. This is a book that has been revealed to you, the Quran. So you should not feel any constraint, any anxiety, any uh, apprehension because of it, meaning because you are, O Prophet وسلم, obligated to convey the Qur'an to people, do not feel any hesitation, any constraint, haraj, any um, apprehension or um, fear regarding conveying this book. Just you know, convey the book with complete uh, conviction. And likewise, this is also a, an address to the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, that we should not feel any haraj in what is in the Quran. You know, people are trying to make us feel bad, are they not? They take verses of the Quran and they try to mock these verses, or they try to misinterpret them, or to um, you know put negative attention or light on these verses. And uh, what do some Muslims end up doing? Oh my God! No, this is not what we believe in. No, we don't. We're not. We don't, we're not people who say this, and we try to become defensive and apologetic. 
what, what do we need to apologize for? We believe in Allah. We believe in the Quran, the final message of Allah. We believe in the final messenger. Everything that they brought is divine, is, is uh, you know, is the truth. It is the absolute truth. Absolute truth. If we believe in the truth, why would do we need to apologize? They should be apologizing for rejecting the truth, for denying the Quran, for mocking the Quran, for not following the Prophet ﷺ. Muslims do not need to apologize. We should be absolutely firm and convinced and we should have no problem with telling them that look you know become muslim and this is the only solution to um your problems this is a solution to the world's problems right except islam we should be have so much conviction may allah give us that conviction that you know we can speak with absolute uh, firmness and yaqeen so that we can live the teachings of the Quran with absolute contentment, satisfaction that, you know, anyone who sees us, they understand that this is a person who has some strong beliefs. This is a person who is convinced. This is a person who is living for a purpose, right? He's not just following the herd, right? He's not just part of the rat race, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, فَلَا يَكُنْ فِي سَدْرِكَ حَرَجٌ مِّنْهُ Like you should ha not have any problem with the Qur'an that I have revealed to you. You shouldn't feel any burden or any anxiety or any fear or any hesitation in regards to its teachings and its commands. So that you warn through the Qur'an and you remind the believers, right? And likewise the believers should also be taking warnings from the Qur'an and making it a reminder and warning others and reminding others also. Allah says, follow that which has been revealed to you from your Lord. Allah says, Like, do you not pay heed or pay attention to how many cities we have destroyed? فَجَاءَهَا بَأْسُنَا بَيَاتًا وَهُمْ أَوْ هُمْ قَائِلُونَ Our punishment came to them during the night, and another verse coming up, while they were sleeping, or during the day, while they were having their siesta, or while they were engaged in amusement, during the day our punishment came to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, decision sometimes to um, destroy a city, a town, comes all of a sudden. And this happens all the time. And it's not like it's just happened to the previous nations. It's happening to us too, right? And 45 seconds and everything's gone, destroyed. This is Allah reminding us that, uh, do you not see all of this happening around you, right? And take lessons from it. فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا And when our decision came to them, their call was only inna kunna ظَالِمِينَ Oh, we, are, we were wrong. We wasted our life. Right. right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us. Allah says, eventually your judgment will be of your good and evil deeds. Allah says, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْحَقِّ On the day of judgment, the weighing of your deeds is absolutely certain. There's no way any human being will be able to escape this uh, weighing, weighing of our deeds. Every human being's deeds will be weighed. Allah says this is absolutely certain. Everyone will have to go through this test, right, without any exception. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Those people whose scales of good deeds will be heavy, they will truly succeed, right, on that most important day. And those whose scales of good deeds will be light, and their evil deeds will outweigh their good deeds. أَنفُسَهُمْ They are the people who would have failed themselves. They will be ultimate failures. بِمَا كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَظْلِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, for the majority of Surah Al-A'raf, Allah starts with the story of Adam alayhi salam. And then he will eventually continue with the story of multiple prophets this is the first surah now in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts speaking about nations before right allah was addressing the ummah and in, in, in different ways 
he spoke about Banu Israel in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, but that was from the perspective of how Allah had blessed them and the way they responded, so that this Ummah, which has also been blessed by Allah, would not respond in the same way. But as uh, a lesson for this Ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, constantly brings the, um, this, the condition of the previous nations as a lesson for this ummah that look look at the way these people behaved and what happened to them and this is a great blessing of allah to the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we are the last ummah there's no ummah to come after this ummah so allah has given us the opportunity to reflect on what the previous nations did and learn from their mistakes right the mistakes they made the consequences they faced this should become a reminder for this ummah so that we don't fall into the same mistakes. And as for the mistakes we make, no one is going to be told of them because there's no nation to come after us. This is also another blessing that Allah told us of what the people of Nuh alayhi salam did, what the people of Hud alayhi salam did, the people of Saleh alayhi salam did, the people of Lut alayhi salam did, the people of Musa alayhi salam did all the wrongs that they committed, the people of Shu'ayb salam did. Allah mentions the stories of seven prophets, one after the other, in uh, considerable detail, right? Uh, all the wrongs that they committed and eventually how they were destroyed. But then when this ummah comes, there's no ummah to come after to tell them about what this ummah did, right? So this is also a blessing of Allah. The wrongs that obviously this ummah is committing will not be conveyed to any subsequent nation because there is no nation. Anyways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with the story of Adam alayhi salam, the creation of Adam alayhi salam, and eventually Iblis shaitan refusing to prostrate after he was commanded with all the other angels upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَخْرُجْ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الصَّاهِرِينَ Like you are cursed. Leave from this noble gathering of angels from this uh, heavenly environment, leave because you are from the humiliated, disgraced. Your, your arrogance and your jealousy, right, has prevented you from fulfilling the command of Allah. Although he was considered to be a great abid, iblis, before the creation of Adam, salam, he was considered to be a great worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to worship Allah along with the angels. Um, but this jealousy that crept into him and this arrogance led to refusing to comply with this command, which caused him to be cursed. Uh, although, because he he was aware, right, of the, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sifat of Allah. But although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was angry with him, he still made a dua to Allah, right? Because he knew Allah's anger, right, does not overpower him. Allah is not like us human beings, where our emotions take the better of us. When we are angry, then like we can't show mercy at the time of anger, right? Uh, when a human being is extremely angry, you don't angry, you don't uh, request them for a favor, right? You wait till they cool down. But in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's state, His anger does not overcome his mercy he's merciful at the same time he's angry right so this does one trait does not overpower the other right? actually his mercy uh, overcomes his 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 wrath like the hadith mentions but so he understood this so even though he was cursed at that moment he said oh allah give me till the day of judgment give me respite Allah said, Inna kamin al -mundhari. Go, you have till the day of judgment to live on this earth, right? As you wish, I will give you this much time. And then you will be sent to the hellfire with the rest of those who follow you. So he was given this, he, his dua was accepted basically. He was given this uh, opportunity. And he swore an oath and he said, That because of the fact that you led me astray, he, he's blaming Allah, right? And, and he's blaming the human being. He's not ready to accept uh, the true reason why he was cursed, because of his arrogance, because of his jealousy. Usually people who have a diseased heart, 
they're, they're, they're not ready to accept their disease, right? That I have arrogance in me, I have jealousy, it's because of this that this happened, right? They're usually very quick to point fingers at others, right? It's because of him, he did it, um, but I had nothing to do with it, right? They just, they're quick to lay blame on others, like Shaitan did. So he blamed Allah, he blamed the human being, and he said, I'm going to sit on the path of the human being, on the, on the path, on the right path, the right path of righteousness, I'm going to sit on his path, every human's path, and I will approach him from in front, from behind, from the right, from the left, from every direction to lead him astray. Right? Allah said, uh, he said to Allah, you're not going to find most human beings to be grateful to you. Meaning, they're going to follow me. They're not going to follow you. Right? And in this way, he became the um, open enemy. Allah says, "Inna shaitan alakum aduun." Shaitan is your open enemy. Aduun mubin. Like he's not even hidden. He's open. He's he has told us already what he is going to do. We are already aware of his tricks, but we still fall prey to him. Right? We still um, listen to him. We still. Uh, um, accept his invitations right unfortunately so shaitan allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us he's your open enemy right so beware of him he's always going to be trying to lead you astray in many different ways he tricks us uh, in um, uh, disobeying the commands of allah right and um going against the teachings of the prophet sallallahu he will make excuses for us right uh, you know, people make excuses for uh, indulging in haram, right? They make excuses from themselves. That's shaitan giving them excuses, right? All of these excuses shaitan makes, he makes it look attractive, right? This is called tazinu shaitan. Shaitan makes his ways look attractive to people. People sometimes don't even realize that they're following in the footsteps of shaitan, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how he was able to trick our father and mother Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam right فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَ shaitan shaitan whispered to them right and he whispered to them to eventually um, لِيُبَدِيَ لَهُمَا مَا وُرِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنْ سَوْآتِهِمَا he whispered to them with this intent that their modesty would be exposed right um, they would start feeling the shame because of the wrong they would eventually commit and he started saying that, look, uh, your Lord has not uh, prohibited you from this tree only so that you don't become angels. He doesn't want you to become angels. He doesn't want you to become eternal like the angels. And then not only did he uh, try to convince Adam السلام, and Hawa السلام, in this way, he swore in the name of Allah. He said, Wallahi. Right. Billahi, tallahi, he used all the qasams that are possible. And now Adam alayhi salam, Hawa alayhi salam, these are the first human beings created by Allah. Their devotion, their loyalty to Allah. If they never heard someone lying in their life, they just started their life, right? Like they would never imagine someone who would swear in the name of Allah an oath and lie to them blatantly, right? So due to many reasons, they were... Uh, they actually fell for his uh, uh, um, deception, right? They actually thought, like Shaitan convinced them that, look, when the when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prohibited you from eating from this tree, that was because you were like freshly made. You were just uh, young humans, right? You were just created, and your human. Um, abilities have not developed fully yet and therefore eating from this tree would be harmful for you because you wouldn't be able to um, you know sustain the effects of this tree because you would become angels and it would be harmful for you but now after a period of time you have developed your capabilities and you are now are able to uh, sustain the effects of this tree and you will eventually become angels so in other words, he's trying to say, you know, he does this ta'wil. You know, people do ta'wil of the ahkam of Allah, right? Oh, the, this hukam is only for this situation. It doesn't apply to us, right? 
So people do these misinterpret misinterpretations all the time of the Quran, of the Hadith, right? They don't want to follow the scholarly interpretation. They take Hadith and interpret it themselves, right? And they misinterpret a Hadith uh, to, um, you know, make things conven convenient for themselves. So this is what Shaitan was doing. He was mis misinterpreting the um, command of Allah. He was trying to say that the command was time restricted. It was only in this specific context that Allah was telling you not to eat from this tree. That uh, context is no longer existent. It doesn't apply anymore. So the original ruling is you can eat from anything from Jannah. So you can eat from this tree too. right? So that ruling was not a uh, uh, was a time restricted ruling and it no longer is applicable and then he started swearing these oaths wallahi you know i'm a well wisher so like obviously adam alayhi salam the innocent human being he was would accept his uh, um, recommendations and then who wouldn't want to become an angel right who wouldn't want to become uh, such a um, you know uh, close creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels. So in this way, he ended up deceiving Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam. And they ate from the tree and eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reproached them, rep reprimanded them that I told you not to listen to shaitan. I told you, um, Did I not prevent, prohibit you from this tree? And did I, did I not tell you that shaitan is an open enemy to you, but you still ended up believing him. Eventually, I mean, this is all part of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, our uh, parents would need to come on earth for us to be born on earth, right? If they didn't come to earth, we wouldn't be on earth, right? Um, so this was all part of the design and wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They realized their mistake. Unlike shaitan, who blamed it on the human, who blamed it on Allah, Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam, they accepted their uh, mistake and they cried and cried. Eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them a dua, a beautiful dua. We should all learn it. This was the dua that our parents made for their forgiveness, the first human beings, for their mistake to be forgiven. And obviously this would be a dua that we should make for our mistakes to be forgiven. Right? And this is actually a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them. Right? Uh, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you want to ask forgiveness from me, say this. I'll forgive you. Right? So, فَتَلَقَّاهَا مِنْ رَبِّي كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ فَتَلَقَّا آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّي كَلِمَاتٍ So these were the kalimat. They said, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh Allah, oh our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you do not forgive us and you do not have mercy on us, we will surely be from the losers. Right? And in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, um, accepted their tawbah and eventually gave certain commands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Banu Adam, human beings, in this surah uh, in four different ways. Allah says, Ya Bani Adam, قَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا يُوَارِي سَوْآتِكُمْ وَرِيشًا وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ فَيْرٍ O oh, son of Adam, O oh, children of Adam, meaning O oh, human beings, we've sent down to you clothing. And this is a blessing of Allah that He has created clothing for us which uh, conceals our most uh, private parts of our body and which becomes a source of adornment for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٍ right? The clothing of righteousness, the clothing that righteous people wear, the clothing of modesty is the best clothing for you. So don't fall into the trickery of shaitan who tried to take your clothing off of you in Jannah, right? By tricking you. So don't follow in his footsteps and wear clothing that is revealing. Wear clothing that uh, clothes your body and adorns it and conceals your body and does not reveal it, right? And we see now what is the situation, right? The more skin that's exposed, the more, uh, you know, uh, attention they get, right? The more they are considered to be progressive, mashallah. Right? They're only progressing in the footsteps of shaitan, right? 
So, and, and revealing clothing does not only mean that the skin is revealed. Revealing clothing is also clothing that is, um, you know, tight to the body, right? Tight clothing. So uh, another deception of shaitan is he makes humans wear clothing that is skin tight. It doesn't make a difference whether they have clothing on or not. You can see the whole shape of their body, right? Which is also revealing clothing. This is also clothing of shaitan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, don't wear the clothing of shaitan. Wear the clothing of the people of taqwa, of righteousness. Clothing that is modest, that is loose. For both males and females, this applies. And unfortunately, we have people who come into the house of Allah with this tight type of clothing. And unfortunately, when they go into sujood, we see the results of that tight clothing, right? Many of us are afflicted with this great test in the masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, protect us. The second uh, address to Banu Adam, Ya Bani Adam, La yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannati yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma liyuriyahuma sawatihima innahu yarakum huwa wa qabilu min haythu la tarawnahum. Allah addresses human beings and says, Oh humans, don't let the shaitan deceive you, fool you, like the way he deceived your parents and caused them to uh, um, exit paradise and he uh, snatched from them their clothing, right? Uh, he sees you, him and his army from places that you cannot see him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that ability to shaitan. Allah says, don't be deceived. Uh, like he deceived your parents, beware of his trickery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further says a third, Ya Bani Adam, خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدٍ O oh, children of Adam, O oh, human beings, adorn yourselves at every place of prostration. Like wear appropriate clothing when you are to prostrate to Allah. Right? This is something we need to be mindful of. When we come to the masjid, when we are going to prostrate to Allah, we should wear appropriate clothing and eat and drink and do not be extravagant. Because Israf is from shaitan too. Right? In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us all those places that shaitan will take us to and how we should be aware and avoid uh, these places. Um, Allah speaks about... Uh, uh, the issue of prohibition, what he has made haram and what he has not made haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in this surah um, mentions conversations between the people of the fire and the people of Jannah. وَنَادَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ أَصْحَابَ النَّارِ right? The people of paradise will call out, converse with the people of the hellfire. And they will say, قَدْ وَجَدَنَا مَا وَعَدَنَا رَبُّنَا حَقًّا We have found that which our Lord had promised us to be true in the Qur'an. Right? Meaning whatever Allah said to us in the Qur'an, we found it to be true. We saw paradise, we saw hellfire, and we saw Yawmul Qiyamah, and everything was true that Allah said to us. Right? We had found it to be true. فَهَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ مَا وَعَدَ رَبُّكُمْ حَقَّ Then they will ask the people of Jahannam, did you find what your Lord had promised to be true? What other answer could they give? They will say, Qalu na'am. Yes, the warnings that Allah gave us, the Jahannam He spoke about, it's all true. Right? And they will respond in this day, uh, in this way. And then a caller will call out between them and they say, The curse of Allah is on the wrongdoers. Those who were warned, who were told, but still they didn't comply, they still disobeyed. Allah also speaks about Ashabul Araf. This is what the surah is named after Araf. Araf means heights or a, a huge wall, right? A barrier, Araf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَى الْأَعْرَافِ رِجَالٌ There will be people on Araf, on, these, uh, on this wall or this barrier or, or on these heights. يَعْرِفُونَ كُلَّمْ بِسِيمَاهُمْ And everyone will recognize who they are. They will know who the Ashab Al-A'raf are. Basically, Ashab Al-A'raf are those people whose good deeds and bad deeds were equal. There will be such people, right? That they were just in the middle. They were 50-50. So they will be made to stay in this plane or in this, on this wall of A'raf, on this height of A'raf, plane of A'raf. And they will be made to stay there for a period of time. And that 
that wall is situated or that plane is situated in such a place that on one side they can see paradise, on the other side they can see hellfire. So they would be able to look both ways. And they will say, وَنَادَوْ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ يَنْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Like they will call out to the people of Jannah and say, سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Although they will not be able to enter Jannah, and nor will they be able to enjoy the food of Jannah. And then they will turn their eyes towards the people of the hellfire. تِلْقَاءَ أَصْحَابِ النَّارِ And they will say, Oh Allah, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا مَعَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Don't make us from these people. Eventually, after a period of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will transfer all of these ashabul araf into paradise. And they will be given entry into paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further speaks about them. And then, like we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the different nations. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوعًا Before that, Allah mentions a, a very... Um, uh, uh, effective verse or if, uh, very eloquent verse. Allah says, وَالْبَلَدُ الطَّيِّبُ يَخْرُجُ نَبَاتُهُ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ وَالَّذِي خَبُثَ لَا يَخْرُجُ إِلَّا نكدا. Allah gives a parable and He says that uh, fertile land will always uh, take out from it crops, right? like vegetation and crops and sustenance. It will take out good, fertile land. الْبَلَدُ uh, الطَّيِّبُ Whereas وَالَّذِي خَبُثَ That land which is infertile Right, which is um, barren. Barren land will not take anything good out except for like thorns and bushes. And this is how Allah gives an example of human beings and their hearts. Some humans, their hearts are fertile. When the rain of Quran rains down on them, good comes out of their hearts. They accept the verses of the Quran. They comply with them. They obey them. And then there are those human beings whose hearts are like this infertile land, right? No matter how much water falls on it, how much Quran is recited to this heart, how many prophets or the prophet speaks to them, their heart does not um, produce anything good. It only produces thorns, right? They only listen to the Quran and they mock it. They only listen to the Quran and they look for objections in it instead of taking guidance from it. Allah says human beings are like this too. And in this way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts speaking about the nations. He says, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ We sent Nuh alayhi salam to his people. We sent Hud alayhi salam to his people after Nuh alayhi salam. After Nuh, Hud alayhi salam we sent Thamud. To Thamud we sent Salih alayhi salam. Then we sent Shu'ayb alayhi salam to the people of Madian. Then eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam being sent to Fir'aun. And the story of Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun continues for uh, a good um, while. Many details are given of this, uh, the story of Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun. Eventually, how uh, initially how he was, Musa alayhi salam invited Fir'aun. Uh, Fir'aun uh, rejected, denied. There was a challenge between Musa salam and the sorcerers, magicians. The magicians realized that this is not a magician. He must be a prophet. When he uh, threw his staff down and it became a huge serpent and consumed all of their little ropes that were made to seem like snakes. They accepted Islam and Fir'aun uh, tortured them, punished them by cutting their hands and their feet. But they still stayed steadfast on Iman and they did not give up their Iman. And in this way, Fir'aun started torturing Banu Israel, started slaughtering their sons and keeping their women alive, right? So that he could use their services. Eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted Fir'aun and the people of Fir'aun with many different tests. There were floods, there were locusts, there was blood, there was uh, lice. Um, uh, There's all these different afflictions that came upon them so that they can pay turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accept Musa alayhi salam's message. But they refuse. Eventually Allah says, uh, We drowned all of them. But after giving them so many chances, opportunities, they still didn't listen, we drowned all of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to speak about Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam and their um, uh, experience with their people, Banu Israel. Right, the different uh, transgressions that Banu Israel committed, even after being saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fell into calf worship. Right, They uh, demanded that they wanted to see Allah. They demanded a book from Allah. There, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a group of the Jews who used to live by the sea, and they were uh, 
uh, fishermen, they would fish and Allah tested them by saying, on Saturday you cannot fish. On Saturday you have to devote yourself to the worship of Allah. They call it the Sabbath, right? You have to observe the Sabbath. And uh, they didn't want to comply with this. So they tried to, again, do ta'wil, right? Make a... Um, you know, interpret the command of Allah in a way that would be convenient to them. So what they would do uh, was uh, they would go and throw out their nets before Saturday, right? Because all the fish, would, they would come in to the harbor on Saturday. And the rest of the days, there would be no fish in the harbor. So they said that we got to find a way to catch these fish. So they threw out their nets before Saturday into the harbor, right? And then uh, when the fish would come in, they would get caught into the nets and they wouldn't catch them. And then the next day on Sunday, they would go and take all the fish. They're like tricking Allah. They still do this. Right? If you study them right now, they're, they're still trying to trick Allah. Right? Um, well, we, I mean, we should also be aware. Like, uh, we also try to twist the rules of the Sharia, right? As if we're tricking Allah. Right? May Allah protect us not to follow in this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually cursed them and trans and then changed them into uh, monkeys. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these people, he sent their punishment down. All of you become monkeys. They all became monkeys. They only lived for three days and then they all died. And none of them lived. So the monkeys of the, today are not from their descendants. Right? People say that they're from the descendants of these. No, they're not. Anyways, in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually um, also addresses the people of Mecca and this ummah in relation to the Prophet that was sent to them, meaning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages to comply with the instructions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The surah ends with uh, an ayat of sajda. Right, the last ayah that we will recite, inshallah, today is an ayat of sajda. Uh, um, this is the first sajda in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that ayah speaks about the, the angels, that they have no arrogance in them, those who are by Allah, the angels, that um, they do not show any arrogance in worshipping Allah. They praise Allah and they fall into prostration before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when we read this ayah, we also prostrate and do sajda. As if we are showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, we are not ashamed of worshipping you either. We have no arrogance in us that is stopping us from worshipping you. We also humble ourselves before you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all humble to his commands. May Allah make it easy for us to uh, comply with his commands, be obedient to him and protect us from his disobedience. Allah save us from kibr, arrogance. Allah save us from jealousy. Allah save us from the tricks of shaitan subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanak allahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta